Hi, and welcome to episode 137 of the Untethered Podcast. Today, we are welcoming back our very first speaker on the podcast, our very first guest, Dr. Richard Baxter. Dr. Baxter is a board-certified pediatric dentist and diplomat of the American Board of Laser Surgery. He's a nationally recognized speaker on tongue ties, instructor of the comprehensive online course, Tongue Tied Academy, and lead author of the best-selling book, Tongue Tied, How a Tiny String Under the Tongue Impacts Nursing, Speech, Feeding, and More. He's passionate about educating parents and healthcare practitioners about the effects a tongue tie can have throughout the lifespan. He lives in Birmingham, Alabama with his wife, Tara, and their three girls, Hannah, Noel, and Molly. He's the founder and owner of Alabama Tongue Tie Center, where he uses a COT laser to release oral restrictions that are causing nursing, speech, dental, sleep, and feeding issues. He had a tongue tie himself, and all three of his girls were treated for tongue and lip tie at birth. So for him, this field is a personal one. Quick disclaimer, all information, content, and material of this podcast are the opinions of the speakers and is for the informational purpose only and not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation, diagnosis, and or medical treatment of a qualified healthcare provider. Welcome to the Untethered Podcast. I am your host, Hallie Balkin. I'm a certified orofacial myologist, feeding specialist, and mentor. This podcast is all about getting your questions answered and collaborating with colleagues to bring you the most up-to-date information in the orofacial myofunctional therapy, tethered oral tissue, and airway space. I challenge you to keep an open mind and join my mission to get this information out to the masses. Let's get started. All right. Well, Richard, I am so excited to welcome you back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I know I was like the first guest, right? Uh, it's you been, are. How long has it been? Like a year and a half, two years, or? Yes, it's been uh, two, just over two years. We two launched years. in July 2019, and you were you were episode number two, the first guest. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I'm excited to be back. Thanks for having me. <laughs> exciting. So I'm excited too, because I know we're going to talk a bit about some of the research that you've done over the past couple of years. I know that you had your speech feeding and sleep perspective cohort study that was published in clinical pediatrics in September, 2020. And uh, that was exciting for all of us in this space. So let's, let's jump right on in and talk about that. What, What can you tell us about what you did there and your findings? Yeah, so I was just looking at kind of the research that's available. A lot of it's smaller studies like Messner, Lalakia, 2000, 2002, like 10 patients, 11 patients. Um, A lot of it just focused on one aspect, so like articulation. Uh, But like, as you know, speech is so much more than just articulation. Um, But anyway, it's uh, we had a prospective cohort study, meaning whether we were going to see good results or not. Hey, you're in the study, no matter what happens. And so we took all those people and... um, can you hear the, is there a leaf blower in the background? Can you hear that now? I don't hear that. We're okay. okay so it's it, right next to Just cut this part out. But anyway, we'll edit that out. Um, I, I went like great. The leaf blower just started outside my window. Um, it's my anyway. kind of luck. It's all good. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we basically had this research idea where we want to look at holistically like speech, feeding, sleep, and then all the other weird stuff like, like constipation, like you talk about on the podcast before, which is mind blowing. These kids like have less constipation afterward. Um, anyway, so we looked at all these things and uh, we had 37, we actually had around 50 people enroll and then about 37 of them actually did the follow up for the one week and the one month uh, checkup, which is really difficult to do clinical research unless you're at like a big academic center. Um, so it's really as close as you can get to randomized control trial in an office where people are coming to you re- referred from you. And so, uh, yeah, the results we had, we had statistically significant results for improved speech, feeding, sleep at one week and one month, Um, certain things like slow eating, picky eating, we saw improvements with, um, with snoring, gasp, like, uh, let me find it here, Uh, mumbling or speaking softly, speech delay, this is the first article to to report an improvement with speech delay. And what was interesting was, like, for example, eight of the moms uh, out of the 16 that said they had 16 said they had speech delay eight of them improved, but overall 13 actually saw improvement. So that means that five saw improvement and the parents didn't even realize like, oh, like my kid's talking more now after the procedure. Um, So sometimes they don't realize things like, you know, poor sleep quality or issues until they see it improved after the release. Um, But yeah, trouble with sounds, uh, difficulty speaking fast, getting words out, trouble for other people to understand, frustrated communication, all those were highly significant um, with eating, slow eating, grazing on food throughout the day, picky eating, uh, choking or gagging on foods and spitting out foods all saw improvement as well. A lot of those highly significant, like 0.001 for the p value. Uh, and then sleep as well saw some improvements. We get the table here. Um, sleeping in weird positions, kicking, moving at night, sleeping more deeply, 
uh, wetting the bed was almost significant. It's like less wetting the bed, waking up less tired, less teeth grinding, less sleep with the mouth open and less snoring. So uh, we also had some less gasping for air too, but it wasn't significant uh, because only a few people indicated it, but 11 out of the 37 saw less gasping for air. Uh, constipation was also significant. Um, wow. So less hyperactivity, less reflux, like lots of things. So this is really the first study to look at it holistically and look at just basically took our, our assessment form that we, uh, we were talking before the podcast about how it's hard because like you don't grade those like, okay, this is one point, this is two points for this. It's, it's really kind of a nebulous concept. So we try to put some handles on it to say like, okay, these people saw improvement with these, these things. It really can work if it's done properly, you have proper release, proper team approach, all that kind of stuff that you guys preach on the podcast. Uh, yeah, I just, this is one of my favorite podcasts. So I'm <laughs> excited to be back. <laughs> Thank <on>. you. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's, it's incredible. And it's one of those things where until you start working in this space and until you work with enough cases where you can start to see patterns, you know, a lot of, I think, feeding therapists don't really truly recognize that a lot of the results that we see following a phrenectomy or frenuloplasty is directly connected to the fact that the tongue is now mobile and the tongue can with proper pre and post-op, you know, therapeutic intervention, it can now do what it needs to do. And I mean, it's, it's, in, you know, people always say to me, well, I don't understand the connection between like constipation. And I was like, look, I don't understand it either. But my theory is that if our tongue is able to lateralize to the molars and move, yeah. you know, move the food over so we can properly prep a bolus and we can then swallow without extra air, we're swallowing less air. So we have less, you know, digestive mm -hmm. upset. We are prepping the food better. So our body can digest yes. the food better. And, you know, I saw this in my own 24 month old where I, the next day her constipation disappeared yeah. and never and came back. back. Yeah, that's <laughs> like, the parents just tell this? this unsolicited. They're like, my kid has less constipation. Like I didn't even ask the parents before or tell them that's a possibility. And they just come back saying that I was like, well, I should add it to the list then of, of symptoms. And then we're seeing these kids with bowel impactions and all these issues. And they've been to the GI specialist. They don't know what's going on. They're on all kinds of medicines and stuff. And then we have the release and it, it is improved. I th three reasons I've, I've, my hypotheses like yours, I tell the parents if they can start, if the food starts the journey, right, it should end the journey, right? <laughs> so if they can chew it about better, obviously, if it, you know, the body can digest it. Chewing is the first step in digestion. Also the strength of the swallow. I feel like they do have a stronger swallow um, afterward. And from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, but the swallow, that wave of the swallow actually becomes the peristaltic wave that travels most, if not all the GI tract. And the third reason is just parasympathetic. So when you release that, it puts them more into parasympathetic rest and digest versus fight or flight. Um, yeah. so that probably along with what you were talking about, uh, some of the reasons behind it, but that's, that's the interesting thing. Like, like the less neck tension that has to do with the fascia. There's, there's so many connections here. Um, that we see on, on literally a daily basis uh, with babies to kids to adults. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Well, and that's that whole, that deep, you know, frontal line of that yep. fascia, fascia trains. It's, I love that image that circulates mm -hmm. social media yep. where we can see how our fat from our, the tip of our tongue is literally connected all the way down to the tip of our toes. And so yep. it's no wonder if you understand anatomy and physiology and the connection, you know, how the tongue connects to the hyoid and the hyoid's supposed to elevate and come forward. And if things are tense, and mm -hmm. not functioning properly, it just, it ups, there's upset throughout the entire digestive mm -hmm. tract from your mouth down to your stomach. Yeah. So it's, I know. it does make That's sense. And end. like, how does that have anything to, I was like, I know it's crazy. <laughs> or like people saying like, oh, I'm doing yoga and like, I'm backward now. Like I'm upside down. Like what is going on? Like I'm so much more flexible. Or people like, I could barely touch my toes. Like and me personally, I could touch my toes, but not like that. Well, I can get my hands almost flat on the floor now after my, and I didn't think about it. Cause I was like, you know, stretching when I was like, Whoa, like I am way more flexible and like nothing else has changed. Um, yeah. so anyway, yeah. it is cool. No, it's, it's interesting too. Lily had her release at 24 months and then she went into expansion with the ALF at for right before her fourth birthday. And we have this picture that the dentist took of her extending, you know, her, her neck upward and mm -hmm. her range of motion. We had no body work because COVID our area, area was highly yeah. shut down. Um, during her alpha appliance and her extension of her neck almost doubled in wow. range of motion um, yep. compared to the start of the appliance and at the end of the appliance. Now, I don't think we would have gotten that if her tongue hadn't been pre previously released, sure. uh, but it was also just so incredible to see what happens when you start to put 
you know, hard tissue in place and what it allows the soft tissue, you know, how they yeah. support each other. It's just, oh yeah, it, it's phenomenal. <laughs> function, vice versa. I love having like moms that are SLPs or OTs or PTs. And since so they're so observant with their own kids, we had one just last week and mom's like, he's like crossing midline better. And like, I don't even understand <laughs> all that stuff, but like, that's a good thing from what I understand. Like all these things they've been working on in OT and like now he's doing those better or kids that should be crawling and they start crawling like that week. Like, oh, it's just a coincidence. It's like, I mean, like you should have been for a while. Like, you know, it's like you put yeah. the turkey in the oven and it comes out brown. It's like, it was probably the heat right then. <laughs> it's not the whole picture, but like, you know, it was that little, you know, or like they should be walking. They're like 18 months and they start walking like the next day. I mean, like yeah. it's not every patient. So we never guarantee it. I always tell them if I guarantee it, it won't work. So right. Like, exactly. Like, well, hope and pray for the best, but I'm not going to like, you know, I don't want to ruin it for you. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, we see, and we see that all the time and it's, it's incredible. It's so incredible. And you want to tell parents, like, we're not going to promise you all these outcomes, but we should be looking at, you know, what's going on beforehand and yeah. doing whatever therapy is necessary leading up to a release. And then again, reviewing that information afterwards, because getting to some standardized form of assessing these children would be ideal, but you know, like, like we said already, I think, and like we talked about before recording, there's just, there's no standardized pediatric feeding assessment. Uh -huh. There's commonly used assessments. I made one inside feed the peas, which, you know, we had from the Mayo airway, tetheral tissue, pediatric feeding specialist, OT, SLP, we all, you know, put our heads together and it's very comprehensive, but it's also very hard to quantify some of what we it observe is. in our, our feeding evals. So that makes it tricky. We'll, we'll keep working on the research though. If you think yes, of something, let me know. <laughs> a yes, research yeah, idea. If you listeners have any research yes. ideas, let me know. I'm happy to work on that with whatever assessments we can. But. Amazing. Amazing. So now let's talk about the tongue restriction questionnaire, right? So this was published yeah. in March, 2021. So tell me yeah. about that. So basically, hold on one second. Hold on one second, Allie. You're fine. <laughs> Estoy grabando una. Ah, oh, sí, sí, lo siento. <laughs> Gracias. El otro, el otro lado de la casa. Gracias. Okay, sorry. All good, all good. He was like right outside the window this time. It's it's the yard guy. Thankfully, I speak Spanish. I could tell him. But That's anyway. perfect. No, it's amazing. In our old house, and actually, they came this morning. Um, in our old house, though. I would always schedule podcasts on the day when I knew they weren't coming and then yeah. they wouldn't come on their dedicated day and they'd come the day I was recording a podcast. And I was like, I know I'm sorry. Okay, anyway. We're just gonna have to sit here for 10 minutes and wait. <laughs> okay, at, least we can, at the beginning of the thought, I'll go back to the TRQ here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So here, I'll re-ask you the question. Um, so I know the tongue restriction questionnaire, which was published in March, 2021. So not too long ago. Um, is it's new and it's really to screen children. So can you tell us a little bit about that so our listeners can understand what that is and how they can find it? Yeah, and you can download all these on our website. Um, it's tongtieal.com. If you look at the blog, tongtieal.com slash blog, you can find them all. They're, they're in there somewhere. But anyway, basically we had about 300 kids and this was not kids coming to us for tongue tie. This is just kids coming to us for you know normal dental reasons. And I thought, you know, we need to have some kind of a screening tool kind of like a greatest hits of our about 50 or 55 item questionnaire. So we got it down to like maybe 15 or 20 items that parents can just sit there and do uh, that are the most like slow eating, like frustration with communication, that kind of stuff. And so basically it's designed to be used. You could use it in a speech practice. You could use it in OT, PT. You could use it as a well child check if you're a pediatrician or as a dentist, like we were doing. So uh, just for a hygiene check, basically when the parents come in for their um, cleaning, we'd give them the form, have them fill it out. And then we would check the patient. Uh, we have the hygienist check first. And they had some myo training, as I mentioned earlier, but uh, they would, you know, check for the tongue range of motion ratio. Basically, you know, of grade one through four, how high can they elevate their tongue? Because that's the real key, right? Protrusion it doesn't tell you that much. It tells you a little bit if it's really bad, but we do a ton of kids that can stick their tongue out. So, uh, but still have tons of issues because the symptoms and function are always more important than the appearance. Uh, so anyway, we had them lifted up and then I came and checked independently and we had high inter-rater reliability. Uh, and then, uh, but what we saw, saw was that was interesting was a lot of these kids, again, snoring, all these things that are common, like 20% of the kids snored, 30% of the kids snored. Um, but if they had issues as a baby, it was high, higher correlated uh, to having issues as a child. So again, early treatment is better. Uh, we did see that um, often these symptoms like spitting out food, slow eating, um, 
uh, let's see what else, milk leaking out of the mouth as babies had a higher risk of having uh, issues currently. But really the key takeaway was like 26% of the kids, I think it was, I was trying to find it here, had symptoms and an appearance bad enough where after talking to the parents, they thought, yeah, it's probably best to get this checked out. Like we want to look into this like for a deeper evaluation. Basically we said like refer to like the tongue tie center because they're in the dental office. And so, I mean, if it's a quarter of the kids and, and it's likely higher than that, because in our office, we've already picked out a lot of the kids that have pretty obvious tongue ties and they've, we've already fixed them. So this is excluding those kids. Um, but yeah, it's, it's extremely common is the main takeaway. And you can use this tool to screen. We have two different versions of it. One that includes the baby issues and one that doesn't include that. Um, and it always looks at, you know, quality of life. So if they have all these symptoms, but it's not causing issue with quality of life, well, then it's not worth doing for the parents. So, hey, mom, just wait. If it comes an issue later, then let us know. Um, and obviously that takes some parent education too, right? Because some parents are like, oh, snoring, it's so cute. He snores, like he's still bedwetting, like when he's like eight or nine, like that's not, you know, it's common, but it's not normal. Um, so having those discussions with parents is, is always helpful. Uh, just, so it's basically to create a dialogue between parents and the professionals, um, whoever that may be. Uh, so we can identify these kids early because as we talk about on the podcast all the time, like early treatment is key. Um, you know, with brain development, by the time they're age three, they're 80% size of an adult brain. By the time they're age uh, five, they're 90% size of an adult brain. And so, yeah, the earlier we can get these kids, the better. And um, so the more tools uh, that are easy to use and don't take up a lot of time because we're all busy, right? Uh, the better it will be. So yeah, that's a little bit about the TRQ. I love it. I love it. I love anything that we can use that's been studied that we know is making an impact. And I think that it's really phenomenal that, you know, the hygienists who are already in the mouth are able to use a really quick tool to help them identify, you know, I'm sure it's like imprinted into our brains in your office, but yeah, I try like, to, like, you know, yeah. three eyes, like it's like that obvious to them. They're like, <laughs> this is really obvious. And interestingly enough too, the ones that can't hold water in their mouth, right? It's so like when they're rinsing them out or cleaning them out and they're laid back and the water's in their mouth, the ones that are choking or gagging, cause they can't get the posterior part of their tongue up to form a seal. Mallory, my hygienist was like, yeah, they all have, they all have tongue ties. I'm like, that's honestly like a decent test. Like yeah. have them sip some water and hold it in their mouth and lay back. Like you're at the dentist, the kids that are gagging, choking on water like that, like there's yeah. likely a restriction present. Yeah. And we work on that in myofunctional therapy. Oh, yeah. We work okay. on being able to like lay well, them back. create, yeah, well, if we don't always lay them back, but even just being able to create a tongue, you know, a tongue bowl, that shape, yeah. and then yeah. making the posterior contact, um, you know, with the tongue mm -hmm. to the velum and also holding water in the bowl of your tongue suctioned up against your palate mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. different swallows with your mouth open. Because if sure. you have a tongue thrust, you're not going to be able to do that. If you have a tongue tie, you're going to do it maybe with a lot of compensation or not at all. And then, you mm -hmm. know, really it's about can we, you know, I just, what I just yeah. did, not that you yeah, can yeah. see unless you're not on YouTube, but you know, yeah. can you suction your tongue and swallow saliva or a little bit of water with mm -hmm. your mouth open? Because that's going to give you a good indication as to whether or not the posterior portion of the tongue can come up and help, you know, create that lingual palatal seal and then swallow bolus yeah. properly. So yeah. it's, it was interesting. It's, that's so Remember, fascinating. Like, how long have you known this for? Like, you should have told me like, this is a, really helpful for those kids who are doing fillings on or cleanings and they can't sealants and they can't keep water in their mouth. I'm like, Yes, a lot of them have a tongue restriction. I, yeah. I like the term tongue restriction better because like so many people think they know what a tongue tie is. Like they think it has to be 100% of the way to the tip. Speaking of that, I, I like the grading scales, but like when we're talking to other professionals, some people use Carilla, some use Cotlo, some use other things. So like I'll use just percentages, like, oh, it's like 75% of the way to the tip or something. Um, but yeah, there's just a couple small things. <laughs> yeah. But I always just tell people, cool. like I, I stick with like anterior posterior, because I'm like, if it's, mm -hmm. you know, behind a certain area or if it's not visible, unless you expose the tissue, then it's, yeah. you know, and everybody gets very, you're right. It's, it's hard to you know, know what we're talking like, about. It's a class four or class three. I'm like, well, I need to know what Which scale you're using because <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> it's complicated. Exactly. They're the opposite of each other, but. Yeah. Yeah. And I teach that in, in feed the peds in my tots module, I teach, you know, Hey, here are the scales. Here's what's mm -hmm. available and out there. However, let's just describe what we're seeing and the functional yeah. impact because, you know, everyone gets so hung up on using scales and in, in my industry. And I'm like, it's, that's not as yeah, important as just like defining. It yeah. But it really is exactly. the functions. It's the symptoms. I mean, yeah. If it, we have so many kids, I'd probably say three quarters of the kids that come see us and, and Dr. Gahari's study from 2016, it was the 78%, I think. So it's, it's probably around this, have a less obvious posterior tie that are coming mm -hmm. to see us. 
Uh, those very often are the ones that have terrible nursing pain, not always, yeah. sometimes anterior, you know, to the tip can have that terrible pain, but it's really unfortunate because most of the ones that are real painful are less obvious. So then the parents are told, oh, it's all in your head, mom, like by the pediatrician, yeah. not to rag on pediatricians. That's maybe that's just in our area, but I have a feeling it's not. It's um, universal. <laughs> It's everywhere. Like, like, oh, it's, it's normal. Like, here's some basically band-aids like, oh, they're colicky. Here's some gripe water. They're gassy. Here's some gas drops. They're refluxy and spitting up. Well, here's some Nexium or Zantac. Oh, sorry. Zantac causes cancer. Never mind. We'll do Pepsid instead. My, my daughter's got Zantac. So it's just like all these things. Oh, they're not or eating. Brittle, broken, broken formula. bones, right? I mean, it's like yeah, these P- I, PPIs and infancy it's create in it's broken in bones in toddlerhood. And, you know, it's there's all kinds of, yeah. In yeah. pediatrics, like the GI, do- if you look at the GI official like gastro uh, guidelines, it says do not use acid suppress acid suppression medications in infants unless it's like a last resort. But most, yeah. like honestly, it's it's given out like candy. So many of yeah. our patients come on it, and like you know, they didn't even realize that it can cause bone fractures and these other issues. So, yeah. and yeah. gut microbiome and everything else. Um, so yeah, it's it's really interesting. Uh, so yeah, band aid, band aid, band aid. Like, what's the root cause here? And yeah. we always tell parents, like, it's not just an infancy, it, it, it's a problem that can last, not always, but it can last throughout lifetime. And yeah, uh, yeah we're taking care of it early, it's better. So yeah, and then I mean, it often snowballs. And then we see, so my practice also treats adults and what we are seeing, which is consistent with the research, and I was just looking this up this morning, it's about 98% of adults with temporomandibular joint disorder have a myofunctional disorder. Yeah, I and myo in myofunctional therapy is very effective in helping them. Yeah. Oftentimes they need more than just Mayo, but it is very effective because, you know, you're the dentist. Yeah. I don't have to tell you, but <laughs> you're holding your arm out all day. Like you're going to get really tight. You're going to get like lots of muscle fatigue in your shoulder, but that's basically what's happening. The jaws is not supported by the tongue, like tripoding on it. So it's just all the forces going to TMJ and um, they get TMJD dysfunction. And if you can get that tongue resting on the palate, you know, the muscles in harmony, then now you're going to be in a much better position. So we have so many people that are just put in splints and like all these things and they don't see much, if any improvement. Uh, sometimes I, I had, it makes it worse. Some I had TMJ problem. Yeah. I had orthognathic surgery, braces three times, like the whole thing, expanders. Um, but no one ever picked up my tongue tie, you know, growing up. I had mine really strong. Same. Stuff, so, <laughs> I yeah. didn't have jaw surgery. I had everything else. I had orthodontic yeah. relapse. I just did two years in the DNA and then Invisalign. Yeah. So yeah. it's crazy. Yeah, it is. So anyway, um, yeah, let's talk about the latest research project. So you've got some more stuff going on, something related to diastemas and sleep. Yeah. So we're trying to get that one published. We're we're encountering a lot of bias. Um, so Dr. Zaghi and I looked through, he ran the stats for me. I had, uh, Ashley, who's actually a, in dental school now in Louisville. So she got in dental school, uh, which is great. She's having a baby soon. Um, but anyway, she went through and measured all the patients that we had for like 2015 to 2018, I think that had teeth, uh, we did a lip tie on. And so we tried to get as many pictures as possible. I said, please like, send us a picture, a current picture, or if they came back for a hygiene check or something, if they were close, uh, we got a picture. We measured the gap digitally. So if your x-ray software, you can measure teeth and stuff like that. So you calibrate it based on the average width of a central incisor and you can measure the gap. Anyway, so we looked at that. The gap decreased in 94.5% of patients. Wow. Now, there was baby teeth, there was permanent teeth that was um, with uh, diode laser, about half of them with diode laser, half with CO2 laser. But if the procedure is done properly, meaning you remove all that tissue uh, down, you know, between the teeth and the diastema, the gap, it closes up almost always. And so we've been trying to get that published probably about a year now. Um, this is why people don't do research, right? <laughs> like <laughs> if, if I had said, I guarantee, if I had said, it causes scar tissue and it's going to, you know, cause all these problems. It would have gotten published like immediately, like in the first journal, because it's like anti tongue tie. And there's this just bias, uh, or that's, and that's goes along with the narrative, right? That's the current thinking, oh, well, if you do, it, it's going to cause scar tissue. Well, if you look where that's based out of all the references I could find point back to Bashara 1972, who was an influential orthodontist who basically said, and never once in the article does it mention scar tissue. The quote is, it seems preferable to close the space orthodontically. Well, duh, he's an orthodontist and then <laughs> release the diastema so it can heal in that position. But it also says it seems preferable to remove the tissue or sorry, uh, to prevent the cause of the diastema if it's predictable and possible. Our study shows it is predictable and possible to remove the cause of the diastema in the first place. Cause we have some patients that come in, we'll release the lip tie and they come back to us a year or two later and they don't need braces at all. 
that was that would have been their only issue was to be a big gap in their teeth, uh, like Michael Strahan. So yeah. anyway, um, it's a huge service you can provide. We're trying to get that data published. I'll keep plugging along. Um, they want a control group, but again, it's so hard. We tried to have the patients like serve as their own controls. So we asked the parents, they could send us a picture from like a year or two before just to show it didn't have any change. Uh, but then they, they couldn't because all their, we tried and they said, all of the pictures of my child, you can't see their upper teeth at all. Like, because their lip is held down so tightly, it was impacting the aesthetic. So uh, with less, um, with the lip tie release, we see improvements with like, I'm sure you probably see this too, like getting food off a spoon, bilabial speech sounds, so BP, M and Ws, improved nasal breathing. A lot of the adults are reporting that, I think because of the fascia release, it feels like that, mm. I think coddle maneuver or whatever it's called, where you put your fingers on the side and kind of open your nares. Um, so it basically feels like that, like your nose is open. Uh, you can breathe easier, which is interesting, uh, which yeah. I would have never really guessed, but something to check your patients for after lip tie release, if, if they have less like nasal resistance when they're breathing. Um, easier to get food off a spoon, uh, more aesthetics. They show more teeth when they're smiling. Um, and some adults will say like, it's like almost like they got Botox, like it like looks, looks nicer. It's just, they're happy with it. Anyway, <laughs> reverse Cupid's bow or something like that. I don't know. I'm, I don't do cosmetic dentistry, just mm, okay. uh, I guess cosmetic <laughs> pediatric dentistry, but <laughs> we do some white crowns in pediatric, but that's it. But yeah, it can releasing the lip pack can have a huge impact. So, um, we're kind of getting that published hopefully soon. That's awesome. That's so exciting. That's, I feel like the more research we can get out there in support of the work we're doing to show what we know to be true, you know, what we see yeah. um, as the other two thirds of the EBP triangle, that's not, if this is not that's in the scientific evidence, I guess, yet. Yeah. Is, is it was like a retrospective against. cohort study. So, I mean, it, it's good. Did you see Dr. Gahari's new study? I'm guessing the posterior tongue yes. tile. Yes, oh, I it's did. It's so good. It's I've been so following good. that. I was excited Amazing. when he got that out there. Cause I mean, it was uh, briefly, I'll just touch, it was on bottle feeding. So people are like, oh, they can't, the nurse just give them a bottle. Like, no, yes. <laughs> First of all, it's like not to breastfeeding shame people. Um, but I, ideally if you can get, you know, I used to think it's just the breast milk's what's important. I mean, it's the actual act of nursing helps to expand the palate. I'm probably preaching the choir here, but anyway. Yeah. Um, so he took a special bottle it's called an infant N F A N T bottle it has a computerized nipple in it. it's for like NIC use and stuff, but it can measure yeah. like the burst duration and like the, how, how well they're nursing and if they can adapt to changes, all these different parameters. And so he took that objective data with bottle feeding babies and it was not anterior tongue ties, it was only posterior tongue ties. And he got it published in like the ENT journal, right? Like the Academy of like otolaryngology journal or whatever it's called. And um, anyway, I was, I was excited to see that. So congratulations, Bobby. Uh, so that's, that's huge because uh, it has objective data. Plus the moms had subjective improvements of less nipple pain, more, they had more confidence on the maternal um, self-efficacy scores above 50, which means they're more likely to continue breastfeeding. Um, so yeah, that was a huge, uh, I sent that out to a few people, um, but that's, that's really good to have that evidence uh, that yeah. Oh yeah. Posterior tongue ties don't exist or they don't cause problems. I'll <laughs> just give them a bottle. Like it just shut all those down. It was published in the ENT journal. So yes, yeah. I love that. I love that. We need more of that, but it's, it's amazing to see this, so you know, it, it's so, so it's, I don't think people realize. it was randomized. Yeah. Like that's so impressive in a private practice basically. Yes. I mean, it was, I was following him from the beginning with like, I think I was one of the people who added like early funding to the project. I was I, like, I, yes, I funded like too. I, I gave him some funding for the project as well because the bottles Let's are get this out there. Oh, they are. Yeah. Well, and, and Enfant has actually sent me some of their bottle top like nipples to trial oh, cool. and I've put them on bottles to see, and they actually work very similarly to like the Dr. Brown's nipples yeah. um, on the yeah, narrow neck. And so, yeah, yeah. so I, I loved that because I'm like, well, these are very similar. And that's kind of the gold standard from a pediatric yeah. feeding standpoint. So I guess I bottom that. says the ones that are like more like breasts are like worse for feeding. Yes. Like babies yeah. don't latch onto this massive, like the Komotomos or the other big ones. Yeah. Like the Dr. Exactly. Brown's narrow, not the wide ones. That's yeah. probably 95% of our patients end up on those. Yeah. And that's great. And that's going to, that's the closest currently that you're going to get to breastfeeding. So that's it's, good. yeah. Um, so now you also have, well, actually, before we go there, I have a question for you. So are there any plans to, or do you know of anything in the active wound care space in terms of like lifting? And, and I don't know what your protocol is for post-op, yeah, but yeah. I think, um, I think everyone's is evolving as you go. And so like one of the keys that we preach with like tongue tied Academy and other stuff, our courses, it's like, 
really, you have to get everyone back for follow-up, at least find out what, how they're doing in a week, if, if nothing else. Because some of our patients are from four or six hours away. We have one family drove 24 hours from Wisconsin wow. to see us because no wow. one would treat their two-year-old. But on the way back, she was already talking better, eating better, you know, at McDonald's, whatever, and not snoring in the car seat anymore. So, I mean, it can have an impact even right away like that. So they were, they were happy and said it was worth every mile they drove. But, uh, but we, we try to get everyone back just because that's the only way you're gonna learn. So in our area, often it's done with a clip or a snip at uh, other places, they don't get them back. It's an incomplete release. There's no wound care. Maybe that's just Alabama. Some people say we're backward down here. I don't know. I'm just- It's, it happens you know, it's all over. Everywhere. It's all <laughs> yeah. over. It's, 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 it's all a worldwide over. issue, honestly. And so, no, but the key is that you can't improve if you don't see people back. And so we changed the settings on the laser from like super pulse to non super pulse to see if that would help. It seemed to help a little bit with less reattachment. One of the big keys with less reattachment was um, having the parents do it before they leave. So we'll have yes. mom or dad put on the gloves before they leave and practice the stretches with one of our assistants showing them how to do it. They show them and then show them because otherwise they get home and like we make it look easy. We just pop in there, boop, 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 done. But they're like, I cannot get this. And often they're not controlling the head. So they have their hands up high, kind of come, come down like a football almost and control the head. And um, we, we just call them stretches. There's exercises in my mind, that's more of the myofunctional exercises, like for older kids, obviously, but for, when it comes to infants, like we just say stretches. Um, people can say lifts or like massages or whatever you want to say, active wound management. Basically you're trying to trick it to heal open essentially. Like if you got your ear pierced, it didn't wear the earring, it's going to close up. Yeah. So that's normal. That's what it's supposed to do. We're trying to trick it to heal open. And so we have them push straight down on the floor of the mouth, right behind the gum ridge, or if they have teeth, if they're older, straight down, and then just right on the diamond, but gently, but firmly and not rubbing on it. Cause if you rub on it, that could cause more inflammation or it obviously hurts more. Um, so, you know, respectfully pushing on it. Um, we say for babies four times a day currently, I think at the breathe Institute with Chelsea and them, they're staying even three now for babies. Don't tell anyone this, it's a podcast, but, um, <laughs> I, so with Molly, my daughter, I did twice a day, almost as an experiment to see what happened. Uh, it's best to experiment on your own kids. Um, but uh, I was working and my wife made me do the stretches. I have no clue why. Um, anyway, <laughs> but uh, so you're the dentist. <laughs> I, I, know, I guess that's why she made me do it. But anyway, uh, so I did it once in the morning, once when I got home and on weekends, I'd throw an extra one in there, but it healed nicely. I mean, she's two and a half years old now, like speaks like a four-year-old, like eating well, like sleeping well, all that stuff. And it did, it did not reattach uh, twice a day. But if you do two super high quality ones a day, it can work. For most people, I think probably four is a sweet spot. If they get three, it's okay. Um, but when we were telling people six a day, like they felt like a failure. Like yeah. it's really hard to do that. They've done studies on like taking pills, which is much smaller ask than having them, you know, basically torture their baby. Uh, or, you know what I mean? Uh, that's what it feels like to them sometimes. It, it's, it stinks. It's not the worst in the world, but it's not fun. Cause they're so sweet and like you love them so yeah. much, you know, and no one wants to hurt their kid. I don't want to hurt their kid either, but I also want for long-term, I want it to work for them instead of just working for a week or two. And then they're like, Oh, Dr. Baxter, I didn't work. So, uh, all that to say, yes, push on four times a day for babies, um, three times a day or so for like older kids. And then for that toddler age, we're set like twice a day, if they're uncooperative or like if they have autism or sensory issues, you know, once in the morning, once in the evening, minimum once a day, like in the morning. Uh, so, because it's been still all night and then during the day they can move it. So I'm not sure if that's similar to what you're seeing, but like that often no man's land is between six months to two or three years old. People are like, Oh, don't treat those at all. But that's the key time. That's what we have yes. to treat them. Yes. Um, and they, they have some crazy changes, even the first week. So like, you know, not, not to knock therapy, obviously I know that's what you guys do, but like that first week, these kids, sometimes they just get their tongue up automatically, or they yeah. they'll start sleeping better or chewing better. And if they're sleeping better, then they have less sensory stuff and they can process the, you know, speech better. And, um, when you combine that with therapy, it's really magical. Uh, but like they, these young kids, it's, it's super cool. It's one of my favorite ages to treat. And you know what, if we have to revise it later when they're five or six and more cooperative, we'll do that. But I don't want to miss out on giving them like 90% better tongue mobility just because we can't get a hundred percent better. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and it improves sleep, which improves cognition, yeah. which improves school, <laughs> which improves, I mean, like friendships what, 10 and to 16 IQ points or something you mentioned the yes. other day. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's uh, the research varies, but it's somewhere between depending on where you read it, like 10 to 16 points lower on that. IQ for, Next well, piece. these are specifically for children with obstructive sleep apnea, but yeah. I, I mean, most of these kids probably have tongue ties and inflammation and they're just the quality of their sleep is not there. Plus now yeah. they're choking during their sleep. It's it's, it's sad, but it's, I've seen some of these kids and these are the kids that are, they just seem kind of like spacey and out to lunch in the classroom yeah. at three years of age. Like they don't respond no. to their name. And now we're wondering, okay. are they hearing or is it a caught, you know, and they're going, oh gosh, this, there's probably some like cognitive issues going on and language delays. And yeah. no, we this child is little... us like that, like yeah. mouth breathing and like kind of spacey and like, oh, like, but what's really <laughs> cool is that intervening, even at three with these yeah. children, I've seen a complete one, like complete yeah. turnaround. That's awesome. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. And so we absolutely need to be working with no man's land. And I've also seen infants too, where sometimes you release that tongue and all of a sudden it's just like, whoop, up on the palate. Yeah. And I'm like, Whoa, they, they, <laughs> that's they so cool. To, it wants to go yeah. up. It's like a magnet, yeah. you know, they, it's being held down. I, I had my tongue down for 30 years and didn't know any better. Me and too. <laughs> My lips were always chapped, like in the summertime, even like, why are my lips always chapped? Like, my, like Napoleon died, I'm like carrying on, you know, chapstick everywhere. And uh, yeah, it was, I, I wasn't like, you know, that much like Napoleon died, but anyway, um, it was like, Tina, come get some ham, you know, uh, anyway, the, it's, it's so key with like getting these kids, the tongue up, the lips sealed, breathing through nose, hundred percent of the time, all the normal myofunctional goals, a good swallow. Um, but yeah, it, it, we just aren't taught that it's not taught in school. It's not taught in residency, dental school, medical school, speech programs. I mean, yeah. So one yeah, of these days, it's crazy. Cool. It seems criminal, yeah. right? I mean, it's just, <laughs> I know, it's but yeah, so I was, I was asking about that because there's just discussions that there's no research, you know, clinical evidence to suggest that active wound care is beneficial. And in fact, it's more harmful because yeah. it's creating and trauma and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it can cause a temporary aversion, you know, for like a few weeks while you're doing it, but normally with, in stopping like but a week or two rare. later. Yeah, yeah. But like, in stopping a week or two later, like they're back to normal. And we tell people like, you know, play in their mouth at other times, like get them used to, you know, motor, you know, just play with them somehow. Um, be respectful, obviously, but some, I mean, with the one or two year olds, if they cannot get the parents can, can, cannot get in there, we'll give them like a malt mouth prop, a, a tooth chair, we call it, uh, to get in there. You can get them on eBay for like $4. So we just give yeah. them out to parents, tell them to keep them. Um, but yeah, it's, it's funny. We told them to keep them one, uh, one last week. And the mom thought we were talking about the baby board we use. It's like a hundred and something dollar board. She took the board with her and I was like, oh gosh, we got to send her a UPS label to get that back. No one saw her walk out there. She took the whole board and was confused. Thought oh we could hold her to take the little tooth chair. Anyway, it was just funny. That's funny. That's so funny. We have to take the tooth chair with them, not the baby board. And uh, it's it's like, just walk out with the dental chair, you know? Right, and, right. Just take the whole thing with you. I'm not sure what you're going to do with that, but okay, if you really want it. Um, but the That's tooth amazing. chair makes a huge difference because if they can't get in there and they can't stretch it, obviously. So and that, yeah. and that just happened from a parent. One dad's like, well, if I had that thing, I could do it. I'm like, Here, dad, you take this. Take yeah. it and you know, I want you to get do in there. Think, do you think, do you think there'll be any future research looking into like active wound care protocols and healing? That's a good idea. Stuff? Yeah. No, we, maybe I'd we'll love to it. see that. Um, that could be kind yeah. of cool. Two times a day versus three. If it's like, uh, I don't want to like mess some kids up for, and, and really like, it's hard to tell because we tell everyone the same thing. And most of the time it still comes back. We have to do like a deeper stretch at a week, meaning yeah. I'll do a stretch and it will separate a little bit. Sometimes it pops open. Um, if that happens, I tell them they got an A, they did a good job. If it just separates a little bit and it has like a little bit of bleeding for a couple minutes, I'll tell them A plus. Um, so everyone gets an A because it's it's hard. It's not easy. Um, yeah. Half the job is just, you know, psychological in nature, like encouraging the parents. And as you know, like um, helping them to see that common does not mean normal, that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah. It'd be cool if we could figure out a way to look into that and standardize it to some extent, which I think is also tricky because variables like kids heal differently. Right. How so there's push? so many like, factors, the pressure, like five Newton squares. Like, I don't know what right. that means. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I know. I know. Obviously we know it's like, I, yeah. I don't know. Obviously we know it helps and it works. It's yeah. I just say firm, but gentle. Cause yeah. When people say I didn't do any stretches, they come back and it's like, back together a, a good bit. And yeah. you know, if it's a week or two, we can pop back open even up to like four or five, six weeks. Sometimes if they're younger, you can stretch it out a little bit. It'll still stretch out. You don't have to re-laser it right away. Um, so we always try that before just jumping and re-lasering it. Cause 
I think if it pops open, I'm thinking probably two more weeks of stretches, but if it, we have to relaser it, it's probably at least three, maybe three and a half more weeks of stretches. And then we get them back weekly if we have to revise it. But it's honestly, it's less than 1%. And after we started showing people like how to physically do it and then getting, being pretty particular, but getting as many people as possible back at one week for follow-up um, and, and more often as needed, obviously, but uh, that's helped like way down on the reattachment rates. That's amazing. And now what about um, sedation? Because I don't think you use sedation in your office. No, that right? we don't. Um, it's kind of a long story. So like if I have a kid that needs like 15 teeth fixed and they're two, right? A dental rehab and they're asleep and they have a tongue tie. Did one, I think last week or whatever. I'll do all their sleep. I'll even suture them up because they got in that situation because the parent, they weren't brushing as well. And so, and, and they're asleep at perfect cooperation. Takes another few minutes. I'll suture them up. So that's the only time I do it when they're asleep. Uh, but if, if they're awake in the office, obviously, Again, they come from a, a distance, most of them. Um, then what we're having to do is we're just, it's 10 seconds. It's about as traumatic as like if they fell down, skinned their knee, or if they got like a flu shot or something. Um, parents will hold their hands. They'll come back with them. We have Coco Melon or whatever up on the TV, uh, Daniel Tiger or Frozen or something on the TV. They'll watch that pretty much by the time they realize it's hurting, we're done. Uh, we use a strong topical jelly, uh, not really injectable lidocaine. I try not to say the S word. We don't say shot in the office. I don't want to scare <laughs> them. Because, um, anyway, but uh, yeah, so if they're like five or so, then we'll do the um, like injectable lidocaine. If I think that, okay, if they feel a pinch, are they going to still sit still? Or like, well, I miss my window of opportunity there. Cause like, oh, they hop up and then they're crying and it's anyway. So we try to yeah. do whatever's going to traumatize them the least. Mm -hmm. And like with the stretches, they stink. But I tell parents like, trust me, mom, if there was a better way, that's what we would do. Like we were all about building a better mousetrap, trying to innovate and improve uh, whatever we can. So yeah, I, love it. I love it. it's 10 seconds for a tongue. It's about 15 seconds for the lip. Um, I'm a little bit old. Obviously for an adult, we take much longer than that. Uh, we're getting there po possibly a little bit of the geniovasis muscle. I took Dr. Zaghi's course. I'm a big fan of his stuff. Um, but we try to get, like in kids, we don't take the genioglossus muscle. It's just the mucosa and the fascia. Um, but it's, it's about 10 seconds, honestly, with a CO2 laser. With the diode laser, it's about a minute. Uh, not, not all mm -hmm. lasers are the same. Uh, diode, NDAG, that kind of stuff. Those are hot tips. Erbium and CO2 are cut optically, meaning it just hovers above it. So um, erbium doesn't have as good of coagulation as the CO2. So that's why the, typically the CO2 wavelength, like light scalpel or solea is what's preferred. Um, people doing releases a lot. Yeah. And then what about, um, cold steel versus, you know, yeah, so and the whole phrenectomy I mean, versus frenuloplasty. Yeah. Yeah. So there's phrenotomy, phrenectomy, phrenuloplasty. Phrenotomy yeah. is like incising it or cut. So like Dr. Gahari, for example, in the article, he said phrenotomy from the medical background, they call it a phrenotomy. He probably just using that for just terminology reasons, but he it's physically, it's a phrenectomy. He's Anytime you're ablating tissue with a laser, he uses the light scalpel CO2, it's, it's disappearing. So you're removing tissue. It's technically a, probably a phrenectomy. Um, that, that's like what we use when you're removing tissue uh, is ectomy. It's like a, uh, anyway. And then a frenuloplasty means rearranging the tissues. So if typically what we do is a horizontal to vertical frenuloplasty means you're cutting horizontally, you're suturing it vertically. There's also a Z-plasty where you're making like triangular pieces and rotating them. I've never done that, but that's, that's the one slide they showed in dental school, right? I think junior year oral surgery, like, here's how we fix a cleft palate. Like, don't try this at home, kids. I'm like, point taken, <laughs> not fixing any cleft palates. And then they're like the next slides, like, this is a Z plasty for a, uh, you know, tongue tie. Like, don't try this at home kids. And it's like, that looks terrible. I'd never do that. And then like fast forward, you know, five, six years. And then yeah, doing uh, tons of them. Uh, not the Z-plasty, but the tongue tie procedures, because it's it's not as complicated as they make it out to seem in, in dental school. And there are a lot of vessels, obviously, in the floor of the mouth. So I'm not saying you just go out there and do it with no training. But now there's so many good training opportunities for people that there's not really an excuse anymore. Like, oh, I, I don't know how to do it or something. So anyway. Yeah. And then going back to like the whole cold steel versus laser. Yeah, I know that you sorry. use a CO2. No, no, that's okay. No, I, I asked you two <laughs> questions. It. So um, I think it's, it's, it's helpful for our listeners because, you know, I've worked with a variety of providers who use yeah. different lasers, who use, you know, cold steel, who do phrenectomies versus frenuloplasties. And then there's the sniff and clip, which always goes to, if I you hear know, onto a clip, phrenectomy. It, yeah. If I hear sniff and clip, that's like a four letter word to me. It was probably not done properly. Yeah, um, because like, oh, it's, it's easy. It's, it's from the mindset of like, you know, sinus surgeries and like all these complicated ENT procedures. I'm like, what, what's the big deal? It's like the tongue, just cut it. Like not a big deal. 
Um, but really, I mean, like Dr. Gahari was doing with scissors for a long time and it's, it's about five cuts, like small little cuts to get like uh, the whole thing. It's not just one cut. Mm-hmm. But with scissors, as soon as you make a cut, it starts bleeding. And then you can't see your landmarks as well. So I can see why they don't want to go deep on that because you could cut like a lingual nerve or artery or vein or something or the muscle um, and, and cause more damage. So, uh, and honestly, if you have a sharp object, like a scalpel, uh, super sharp or scissors in there and the baby's moving or the child's moving, that to me is more dangerous than the laser. The laser, it's soft. I mean, you can touch it on kids, you know, pretend to write on their hand with it. like to show them like it's, you know, it's soft. It doesn't hurt when you touch it. Um, but you just take your foot off the pedal or on the pedal, depending on when you want it. So you don't push your foot down until you have a clean shot. And then if they move at all, you just lift your foot up and it stops immediately. So in my mind, it is safer. If you're following all the laser safety protocols, of course, the laser and use sign, eyeglasses for everyone, um, all that kind of stuff, uh, suction, you get the plume. But yeah, it's uh, if it's done properly, um, then it has lots of good benefits. If it's done halfway, you're probably not gonna see the benefits. And I think that's what gives some people a a bad taste in their mouth and if or there's a pediatrician or whoever like, Oh yeah, tongue tie doesn't work. Yeah. Um, or they see the ones that are to the tip and they have perfect articulation, but they don't realize all the sleep and behavioral and all the feeding issues. Eating. Yeah. You know I mean? mm-hmm. Like they can say there are R's and L's and they, you would never guess based on their articulation. We've had some of those too, but they come in with the other stuff. And yeah. so you'll see one kid like that, like, Oh yeah, we have kids with tongue ties all the time. They're fine. It's like, yeah, they're fine. But like, we want them to thrive. And like, we're going for optimal. And what are your markers, right? What are your markers for fine? What are they're you asking alive. about? Basically, <laughs> right. they're alive still. I mean, you know, <laughs> as long as they're breathing. And again, in the pediatrician's defense, like they have like so many things to go through, like car seat yeah. safety and like substance abuse for older kids. And like, there's so many things, like wearing a helmet when they're riding a bike. Like there's so many things in addition to that they have to hit or like in their notes or else they can get in trouble. Um, then they don't have time to sit there and put all the pieces together of the tongue tie stuff and like look through that lens. Cause it really does take like a paradigm shift to, to see it. Well, this kid does have speech and sleep and eating stuff. And like they had trouble nursing as a baby. I wonder if something's going on that could connect all yeah. those. They don't have time to put that together often and they're not trained. I, would, I mean, I'd love to see, and yeah, that's, that's what we see too. I'd love to see, you know, with my prior pediatrician before we moved, actually my, the first one and the last one too, they would send us in the app, like certain questionnaires before every appointment. There's yep. a ton the first year. It's like every time you go for a well check and then, you know, annually there's those same questions. Yeah. And they're asking, they were asking about the MCHAT to screen for autism. They're asking about, you know, maternal health in the first year to make sure yep. mom's not having trouble with PPA and PPD. And I feel like it's evolved so much that I'm like, can we just throw one more screen in there to ask mm-hmm. about sleep or, and tongue tie, you know, can we mm-hmm. like get this in That's there and find the, out more? The TRQ, the tongue restriction questionnaire. Yeah. And like y'all were talking the other day, like they screen hearing and vision, like honestly, like with the way they circumcise most of the boys uh, in America, there was a documentary on a few years ago called American Circumcision. I watched it. It was interesting, but like often it's really just preference. Like, Hey mom, do you want to have them circumcised or not? Like they're not really doing it for the medical benefit, which even that research is kind of shaky for like less penile cancer and less um, risk of like UTIs, I think, in boys, which is pretty rare to begin with. But what they look at is just preference. And that's like 15 minutes. What we're doing is 15 seconds. We're doing it for current actual issues. That's for potential future issues. But for whatever reason, that's accepted like by pediatricians and society and like, oh yeah, whatever. Like no one even gives it a second thought versus like, as a society, we would be much better off if we just cut everyone's tongue instead of cutting everyone's penis. And I think <laughs> it would be like just from a sleep, breastfeeding, yeah. all that standpoint, it'll never happen. But um, yeah, but you know, it, in the Jewish religion, look, because I'm, yeah, I'm Jewish, you know, all of the boys get it. All the boys have yeah. it. And they don't do it in the hospital. They do it. I think it's about like eight days after, yeah, like, days. like yep. a week after. Yep. Um, and the, the Mohel comes and he gives them like yep. a little um, you know, sterile cotton with dipped in some like wine and, mm-hmm. you know, kosher wine puts it in the baby's mouth and does the snip. Like there's no, yeah. nothing else. And it's a very quick thing, some blessings. And the mother's yeah. like cringing in the corner, you know, and it's like, <laughs> I know it's not, but like the tongue tie, it's so quick. It's way quicker. Cause often in the yeah, hospital, exactly. minutes or so, and then the revision rate is fairly high. So when I'm at the hospital fixing kids teeth, uh, that are like two years old again, with like 15 cavities, we'll just put them to sleep for no reason. But there's a urologist there and he like, I look at his schedule and it's like circumcision, revision, circumcision, revision, circumcision, revision. Like it has to be redone pretty often. Um, oh, wow. So no one ever talks about that. I can't remember what it's like 10% of the time, maybe. Um, I'm huh. not sure. 
don't quote me on that, but it's, it's fairly high, like higher than you think. Interesting. Um, Interesting. Anyway, I think the, yeah, the tongue tie screening for tongue tie, at least screening for myofunctional issues, mouth breathing, like people used to get a grade. I heard one, one parent or grandparent told us like, oh yeah, they got a grade if like their lips were together. Like, you know, if, wow. if they had, I was on like their behavior score or like, um, hmm. anyway, like, like in elementary school, the parents, yeah. were, the, the teachers would assess for that kind of stuff, but it's not done anymore. Um, like and, and breath that talks about, if, if you talk about breath the other day on the podcast, but like, it talks about how people go around the guy, I can't remember his name, um, checking the Indians and stuff. And they would close their lips at the babies, uh, and they wouldn't smile because they were afraid some oxygen would get in through their mouth not through the nose and all the Chinese proverbs and everything breathing through <laughs> nose gives you life and breathing through the mouth gives you death basically. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, all the it is. Yeah. So you have your tongue tied Academy, which I know you've got two versions. I took the version for therapists. So tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah. So basically just out of people asking, like, Hey, we need more training on this. Like, what could we do here? Um, so they're coming to our office for like a, a live course basically, but we needed something to like, get everyone on the same page essentially. So for a year, I was working on this script. Uh, it was actually, it's actually longer than the book, believe it or not. And when COVID hit, it was a perfect time. I like had the film crew, they were going to come anyway, I think like in May. So we just moved that up to March had the, cause we had the office shut down, had nothing else to do. And we basically did that with my COVID project. So my wife's like, you're working more now than like, but like everyone else is shut down and like home with their family. I'm like, I'm still home. Like we, anyway, but I have TMJ issues, as I mentioned. So I was really worried I wouldn't be able to do it because it's eight or nine hour days of filming and just talking, talking, talking. Ended yeah. up it's at 25 hours of video. It's split into modules and lessons. So like each lesson's like five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, depending on yeah, what it is. Great. Um, yeah, it's great. So it's not like it's, it's on demand. So you can watch it during your lunch break. You don't have to like, it's like a zoom thing. Like we're doing now where you have to be present. Um, which uh, there's the place that you guys do the feed the peds that way. I think. You yeah. Assume. Yeah. Yeah. We do a, a combination of like pre-recorded and then we oh, get okay. together to like review st case studies live for an hour each gotcha. week during the 12 week course. But yeah, it's all pre-recorded and my, my new cool mile course too. will be the same. Like it'll be on demand with gotcha. the opportunity to join like office hours. But yeah, I mean, I think that's the way of the world now. They're, like, both, all they're these... both good. Uh, and I can yeah, see self-paced is so good. So I'm not there with people to hold their hand through it, but we tried to make it like an answer, like all the FAQs that people would think in their mind. And so it's literally takes you from the A to Z of, of treating tongue ties, even as a provider. I wish I had that course when I got started, it would have been a lot easier, would have yeah. missed out on a lot of mistakes, but basically people can learn from my mistakes and um, things that were difficult to learn. But yeah. And then with the light version for therapists is 13 hours. Um, if you're a dentist or dental hygienist, they are ADA approved CE hours. So a lot of courses are not because uh, it takes a little bit extra to get that um, the ADA approval. And then um yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. So but we did that over COVID. We've had a ton of people take it and really good feedback from it. Uh, it's just tonguetiedacademy.com. But the one cool thing, we give away all the proceeds from the course, uh, all the proceeds from the live course when we have four dentists a month come in shadow on a Friday. Uh, and we have some lecture time and discussion time. And they basically watch the whole thing. They're holding the baby's head. They're holding the child's head. They're suctioning as much as they can do without a dental license in the state, basically. Um, to, to learn how to do this on their patients and a lot of people feel more confident, but all that money. And then all the money from the book goes in one account and we give it all away to charity basically to, yeah. That's so cool. People that don't have clean water. It. Like, yeah, they walk for three hours a day to get like, you know, fill up their jugs of water or they can't go to school or human trafficking in Nepal. Um, there's a health clinic that we're supporting in Nepal that if you have like a broken leg or a heart attack, you have to hike two hours uphill or three hours downhill. And oh my gosh. for you or me, it would take us four hours because they're used to the elevation and all that stuff. But it's, it's like, you can't hike if you're having a heart attack. So helping right. support a, um, a health clinic there in Nepal. So just this stuff like that, which giving back and I think we're not doing this for the money. Like we're, we're doing it honestly to help spread the word and help um, educate whoever wants to listen. So, yeah. I love that. That's amazing. It's amazing. Well, thank you. This is so great. Is there anything we didn't cover? I feel like we've talked about so much today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully we packed it in for the listeners there because I, I, I'm an avid listener of, of the podcast. Um, I, I'm happy to be back on anytime you'll have me. So yes, sure of course. Days with your yeah, course, we'll my do. course, just talk to ourselves for hours and hours. Exactly, <laughs> right? <laughs> so what's the well, and 
that's that's the new the Mayo method one that I'm creating like in the works of creating now. Hopefully, I didn't lose anything when my computer just shut down before we started recording. Um, it'll all be like self paced, pre recorded as well, and yeah. they take themselves through it. But it's you know I think that's I've had a lot of feedback from clinicians that have said that it's it's such a great way to learn because being yeah. able to chunk it down and learn it, they absorb more. And then you know for mine, being able to go back and they have lifetime access, so to go it. back yeah. and rewatch things as it's relevant yeah. to current patients. I'm like, that's time. so important to me. Yeah, they can um, watch the case that we have 65 case studies. We have a Google Drive with all the articles, all the forms we use, like basically here, get started. Like here's what to have your front desk person say when someone calls, like to that granular. Um, yeah. Because uh, otherwise it's so difficult to get started. It, it's, it's a large barrier to entry kind of thing. And we want to make it accessible, but we also want people to do it the right way. We don't want people mm -hmm. just doing it for the money. We don't want people just doing it, you know, for, um, you know, just to add a service. Like if you want to make more money, do braces, like do ortho, you know, uh, right, do, it, right. obviously do it the right way, like airway focus, but like, this is not like dentistry is more lucrative than tongue ties, right? Like right. people are not doing this to make their laser payments. They're, they're right. doing it because they want to help the patients because I mean, you do a filling and it's like, oh yeah, it's about like it was, you know, like a lot of times they're not having pain really, but with a filling, but with this, like, oh my gosh, these kids are, you're seeing the changes before your eyes and you see them, especially because you're following up with them for months or sometimes years and yeah. they're eating better, talking better, you know, sleeping better, just their whole behavior can change the colicky babies. No baby should be screaming and colicky like that. Like there's yeah. a sign something's wrong, you know, that's terrible, terrible nursing pain for moms. So yeah, there's so many things that are just the intangible rewards you get out of treating the, the tongue tie that makes it worth it. So anyway, absolutely. Well, thank you. And I'll do one last plug. So if anybody has any interesting research ideas in this space, definitely yeah. reach, reach out to Richard and his team or let me know and I'll forward it along yeah. because, you know, I think as long, as long as we continue to evolve as a community, um, we're just going to continue to do right by our patients. So yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, info, yeah. If you have any ideas, info at tongue tie al dot com uh, and then you can download a copy of tongue tied if you haven't yet uh, it's on our page at tongue tie slash professionals you can also download all the forms we use and the articles we talked about are included in there like the trq and everything it's all for free um, so Beautiful. yeah amazing thank you thank you good to see you hallie thanks so much you Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you want to hear more of these Mayo Tots airway and feeding related episodes, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or pledge a small amount on patreon.com forward slash the untethered podcast. If you found value, others you know in this space will too. So be sure to share this episode on your social media platforms and join us over on Facebook, on my Facebook page at Hallie Balkan Biz, on Instagram at, at Hallie Balkan. And you can head over to the untetheredpodcast.com to grab a copy of the show notes, um, where you can also subscribe to be kept up to date on the latest podcast episodes. 